Greetings. I'm here to provide this on video for you so you don't have to rely just on your class notes for that day. And the, re and the reason that I want to make sure that you don't have to just rely on your class notes for the day that I bring this up is because this is what I call the moment of truth. I call it the moment of truth because whether you realize it or not, this is, this is the moment or the time in general when you choose either to be clueless, struggle all semester long, frustra be frustrated, wonder why you study hours and hours and get poor scores on the exams, or the alternative that I prefer, namely that you have a good time and you learn a lot and you discover that the, really the fun never ends unless you let it because you didn't let it. All right, so what am I talking about? Well, about the time I introduced the first graph or model in the course, some of you unknowingly choose to be in denial. Ah, you don't really need to get into that graph. You can let it be spaghetti. You can let it be alphabet soup. You can memorize what you don't understand. There's triangles and there's rectangles. You don't even realize all of that right now. All you see, maybe, maybe you're looking at this video even before you've seen very many graphs in your course. Uh, you may not even realize all the triangles and rectangles and stuff that are going to pop up in some of these graphs that start out pretty simple. But you see, if you don't get the basics when they start out, then when it gets a little more nasty with the same old graph, it's going to be like, uh, where'd that triangle come from? Uh, what does it mean? How do I calculate it? Although the triangle you can calculate one after base times the height. But if you don't know what the number means that results from going one half the base times the height, you probably won't calculate the right thing or know what it means or know what question it's an answer to. All right. So again, this is the moment of truth. This is where you decide that that messy looking, maybe not even all that messy looking at first, that innocuous looking, maybe messy looking graph that you saw in class recently is either going to be your friend or your enemy. All right. So let me just put up one of these on the screen. So another nice thing about this video is you can go and you can, oh, it's my fingers not showing. You can push the button. Where is it? Ah, you can push the button on your computer that says stop. So this graph, I'm going to wrestle with it a little bit here to get it on this screen along with my face here in a second. You can stop it. You can look at the graph and you can decide how long you want to look at it uh, in silence, right, with me muted. And then you can move on further. You can go back and look at it over and over again. And you may need me to do that because you may, despite my urgings on this video, by then you probably are amenable to watching it. Despite my urgings in class, it may take you all before you believe me and decide to not memorize what you don't understand and to uh, disassemble the pieces of the things that I'm talking about so that you can put them back together again and decide what they mean. All right, so here early in the course, we're going to start talking about supply and demand, among other things. And all the graphs are basically the same in the sense of how you approach them. You've got to take apart some of the lines that are drawn on the graph. You've got to put some numbers on points on the graph and talk your way through what they mean, whether it's a production possibilities frontier or marginal analysis, again, depending on when you're watching this video. You may not know what that means yet, that it means that there's a marginal benefit line and a marginal cost line on the graph, or whether it's a graph like this, supply and demand, right? Whoops, a little too close to the screen there. There you go. Only we have just demand on that particular graph. Uh, whether you have that on there or not, it's it's the same basic process. And by the way, the, in one of your learning modules, darn it at the moment, I don't remember exactly which one I put it in, probably the first one, I put in some slides, a copy of an old handout that I've been using probably decades. It's called Practicing to be a Professional. So if you want something in writing that goes through this rather than on a video or both, uh, go to the Practicing to be a Professional handout, probably uh, on in your first learning module. If it's not there, it's the second or the third, okay, early in the course, all right? So it's basically what this video is too, is it says you want to practice to be a professional. This is the kind of stuff you need to do. You need to understand what you're working with and not just try to memorize something you don't understand. All right, so we're going to start out here in this first one by looking at a demand line. Wow, it doesn't sound very complicated. But there's all kinds of ways you can get tripped up by it if you don't know what you're talking about. For example, demand means something different than quantity demanded. Demand means, let me see if I can I get kind of weird out with this. Kind of back up and move over to the side. And I always get it backwards. 
is a screen's a mirror image that I'm looking at as I'm recording. All right, so I'm barely on the screen, and your graph is right in the there we go. Your graph is right in the middle. Okay, so there's a demand line. The demand line is all the points connecting supply, uh, connecting price and quantity demanded that pertain to a given product, in this case, concrete. As I like concrete examples. <laughs> See, the fun never ends unless you let it. I'm having fun with this. Got to. All right, so this graph is about the market for concrete. And just for this, for the moment, just the demand side of the market. That's the buyers, the consumers. And you see, one of the points that you always want to deal with is the upper left hand most one, right? Left hand, right? Okay, yeah, it's left hand to you. Okay, where it says 23. And of course, you always have to start off with understanding what the stuff on the uh, y and x axis means. There's a P there. P for what? Price. Price meaning what? Dollars per unit, right? And the units here are tons. Right? Tons a good one. You'll see that a lot because it's a short one, right? Gallons is a long word. Cubic feet is a long thing. Eh. But I mean, that's what we mean by units. The units of the good in particular. Tons of concrete, price per ton. So $23 a ton is that point there. And it's at zero quantity demanded. That's what the Q stands for in tons per day. Okay, so dollars per ton can, for price connect how much people want to buy in tons, in this case, per day. It could be per week, and we would better make the number seven times bigger. Unless they only buy five days a week, then five times bigger. Okay, uh, or consume five times a day, or five times a week, and that's seven. If it's per month, eh, it's a little nastier because some months have 30 days and some have 31. Maybe it'll be uh, per year, right? 365 times the size of these numbers then would apply, right? So make sure you can connect the quantities to the prices numerically, all right? So back to that first point up here where it says 23 and the other coordinate to that point, the x-axis coordinate is zero. That means that $23 per ton or higher, there is no demand line. There is, there are no points, which means that there is no, there are no purchases at a price of $23 per ton or higher, right? But for any price below $23, like $22.99 or $22 or $21 or whatever, anything lower than $23, there will be some concrete purchased, okay? And that's important for, for several reasons. It's important for one reason is where to anchor your demand line. Okay, and again, what does demand mean? All the combinations of price and quantity that pertain to a given good, and sometimes it forms a straight line, but not always. It could form a curved line. Typically, it forms a downward sloping line because when things get more expensive, people don't buy as much. Don't get that confused with supply because that's talking about producers. We'll do that in a minute, maybe probably on the next video. I'll probably take a break. Uh, where the line slopes upward, saying that suppliers offer more to, for sale the higher the price. Okay, so don't get those two confused. Demand is about buyers, and they want bargains, right? Cheaper, they buy more. Uh, suppliers want to make profits, so the higher the price, the more they're willing to sell, and the more they're able to sell, right? A higher price makes it possible to acquire more resources to make more of the product. All right, so somebody out there, is willing to pay $22.99 for this good. Now, whether they have to or not will depend on market conditions. But according to this demand line, someone out there, if they had to, if the market conditions forced them to, would purchase some concrete for just under $23, $22.99. So, for example, if they're able to purchase at $15, they enjoy a gain from trade, we call that. A uh, gain from trade for buyers is sometimes often called consumer surplus right don't get that confused with a market surplus which is physically in, uh, you know tons per day or, or gallons per week or something like that a consumer surplus is measured in dollars right it's the difference between what someone values it at that's the basis of demand right gotta be careful i point my fingers everything's backwards I get my brain to to realize that which I what I think I'm doing is the wrong hand. All right. So buyers like bargains, sellers like profits. You get a downward sloping line typically. Sometimes it's vertical. Sometimes people have to buy it. They need it, regardless of price, and we get a vertical demand line. But in every all other cases we get a downward sloping. 
and indicating at what rate, see all this information in here, indicating at what rate, the screen went blank for a minute there, indicating at what rate people buy more when the price is lower or indicating at what rate they buy less. Okay, and this is a market demand line, right? You can have a demand line for an individual person, but here we're talking about the whole market. So this demand line is an aggregation, a combination of the demand for this commodity concrete by all the people that are in the geographic area represented by this particular market. Okay, so the person, if they're able to buy it for $15, the person who would purchase it if they had to for $22.99 enjoys a $7.99 gain from trade for that one ton of concrete that they would pay that much for. Okay, and of course, there would be a bigger gain from trade if the price was lower and a bigger, a lower gain from trade if the price is higher than 15. The market will determine the price. The marginal consumer will have no gain from trade, right? Because the, the marginal consumer means the one and it's just barely willing to purchase the product at that given price. That means it's barely worth to them what they have to pay. Have you ever experienced that at the store? Been the marginal consumer? I bet you never thought of yourself that way. The marginal consumer? Uh, that means that you pick up the product. Get my hand on the screen here. You pick up the product, right? You look at it. Price tag on it. Uh, price is kind of high. Put it down. Pick it up again. Look at it. Do that a couple times. You think about how much time it would cost to go buy it somewhere else, or maybe it's not even available someplace else, and what you're going to use it for, how important that is. And you do this thing back and forth a couple times, you say, oh, well, and you put it in your basket and you take it. That behavior, that thought process, whether it's represented by that particular motion with your hands and stuff or not, means you're the marginal consumer. It means if the price had been any higher than what it was posted on the top of that thing, the price tag, you would have left it there and you wouldn't have taken it and you wouldn't have paid for it. All right. And there always are marginal consumers. The fact that you may never have been or all that often doesn't mean that they don't exist because when prices change, the total amount sale sold, all things held constant will change. And okay, proof that there are marginal consumers. All right. So if the price is $15, okay, Okay, the quantity purchased will be 80. Okay, that's one of the things we can do with the demand line. We can either predict the amount sold that will sell at that price, or if we have a certain quantity and we're determined to sell all of it, what price to charge, the maximum price we can charge, and still sell all of it. So, for example, uh, at a, if we have 80 out there, we say it's perishable, you know, maybe it's perishable, it's going to rot, uh, or like it's a newspaper, then tomorrow it's not worth anything. Okay, so go up to the demand line. See, that's why a demand line is a nice thing to know. Uh, that's a nice thing to maybe pay somebody if you have to, to collect the data and estimate the demand for it, because then you know exactly how much you can charge for a given amount of stuff and still sell it all and not have any left over that you have to throw away. Okay, or maybe mark down and sell, sell the next day. All right, and that's important to most businesses, because in our very competitive world, selling it for as much as you can may be the difference between survival and having to pull the plug and saying this isn't working. Uh, I better bail out of here before I have to file bankruptcy or ultimately if you persist having to file bankruptcy. All right, so let's go back to that consumer surplus concept again and actually figure one. Suppose the price is 15, right? So you have a series of valuations. Every point on this line represents what someone or maybe more than one person actually values the good. We've already established that somebody out there values it at $2.99. Someone else, a little further down, do you notice my finger move just a teensy weensy bit? Yeah. Someone else out there says if the price is $22, uh, I'll reluctantly buy it. If it's any more than that, <clears throat> okay, so that person at a price of 15 is making a $7 gain from trade. Somebody else out there $20 is their maximum willingness to pay, okay, the most they value it at. And see, they, they might buy one for 20 if they had to, and then if offered another one for 19, they might buy another one. But for 20, you know, that there's there's only so many they'll buy, okay? So, but, but then at 15, that means there's a $5 gain on that purchase, right? And if they're willing to buy another one for 19, there's a $4 gain on that purchase and so on. All the way down to the marginal consumer, that buys the 80th one, 
for fifteen dollars and is just barely willing to purchase it. You know that thing about looking at it. And, uh, it's fifteen dollars. Uh, fifty. All right. Okay. That marginal consumer who who's maximum willingness to pay at least for the last increment where they're doing this, looking at the price tag, uh, buying it or finally putting it back and leaving it there. Well, buying it in this case, uh, saying okay, fifteen. Yeah. All right. I'll purchase it. All right. So the demand line tells us what the product is worth to somebody out there up to $22.99. And by the way, it shows us that if we had the price of zero, we could give away, right? Zero is giving away 230 of them. So giving away, there's still costs. You still have to pick it up and haul it off. Just that not having to pay for it doesn't eliminate costs. So uh, 230 will be tons per per day will be hauled off if they're just set out there and, and there's no charge for them okay that's how fast they'll disappear for free okay uh, so let's figure out the consumer surplus per day at a price of fifteen dollars how do we do that given that there's 80 tons purchased per day at that fifteen dollar price do we estimate the gain from trade for each of the 80 tons and then add 80 things together? Well, it could. It would work. Okay, that's boring, tedious. A simpler way to do it. The consumer surplus is demand minus price up to the quantity purchased. Okay, so demand there. Okay, there. Price 15. Okay, ah. Oh, See what I meant about the beginning there about triangles? Yeah, my voice is starting to break up. I might have to per terminate this video in a minute and go get a drink of water. Okay. See what I mean about triangles? There's your first one. The consumer surplus triangle. Right there where my index finger is. Right? The difference between demand and price. Demand line up to quantity 80. Okay. The dotted line over the price that forms a triangle. And one side of the triangle is 23 minus 15 long, 8, right? And the other, and by the way, I have a uh, thing here. Uh, oh, here it is. But I'll put up in a minute to cover all of that stuff. So you don't, I mean, you should write it down because writing down is good. By the way, another recommendation for the semester, throw away that highlight marker. Yeah, well, or save it for something else. That's not the way to study. It's just to highlight sentences. I mean, with the end of the, at the end of the thing, uh, You'll probably highlight it two thirds of it. It won't make any difference. Okay, so take notes like watching this video. Take notes while you're reading your textbook. Take notes while you're watching other videos. Okay, writing things down engraves it in the gray matter. Right, you have a good great idea. Write it down. About half the time, it'll cease to be a good idea once you write it down. The writing process makes you think about it and makes you think of all the reasons that it's either awesome or nah, not so practical, or yeah, there's some issues there, need some work, need some more thought. All right, so anyway, back to our consumer surplus triangle. It's 23 minus 15 on the y-axis side, and the other side is 80 long on the x-axis side. So 8 times 80, I can do that in my head, that's 640. Ah, but it's a triangle, so it's not a square. You don't just multiply length times width or base times height. It's half of a, a half of a rectangle, or half of a square. Okay, so 8, 23 minus 15 is 8, times 80 divided by 2. I can still do that in my head. That's 640 divided by 2 is 320. Okay, so, and then now what is the 320? What does that mean? You're just going to memorize stuff and just go through it and, oh, that's 3, 320 what? $320 per day gain from trade for buyers purchasing the product for $15 a ton. Ah, see? And you can go through that. You can stop the video and replay it. You can do that again. So I'll, I won't repeat it since you can make me repeat it. Isn't that cool? You can take your professor and fast forward them and rewind them and stop them. Silence! Quiet! See? And then suddenly I'm quiet because you push the button. Anyway, you can't do that in class quite as well. You can raise your hand and that'll stop me for a second until I hear your question. And that's that's good to do. See, that's why why uh, uh, we have classes. This I mean, this this might be also be part of an online course. So, you know, there the alternative is uh, uh, to go online at the online forum, right? Same thing, right? You're providing feedback and you're getting feedback from 
from your from me and from your other classmates all right so the buyer's gain from trade the consumer surplus given these conditions there goes the screen again in case you're still watching there it is that's back buyers gain from trade at fifteen dollars per ton given this demand for concrete as indicated by this demand line okay it would be three hundred and twenty dollars per day all right again every single point on that line indicates the incremental value of the good right which and then subtracting that from the price of the good gets the buyer's gain from trade let, let me go over that again to make sure that that's crystal clear for those of you who saw the tom cruise movie crystal clear uh yeah many years ago maybe before your time sorry about that i keep acting old uh okay so I'll just we'll just again use the points that are on there that dot up here in the demand line right maybe i should call it point a maybe not oops my hand's covering it there it is that point on the demand line indicates that the incremental value the addition to total value or total benefit of the 80th one is 15 dollars per ton right so compared to buying 79 of them okay or for the total sales of the good to be 79 since we're talking a market there's a lot of consumers in any given market typically compared to 79 of them selling when 80 are sold the total benefits to society increased by 15 dollars right so the points on the demand line indicate incremental value and the alphabet soup of this you'll see a lot of msbs and mpbs and mpcs and mscs and acs and mcs see you're forewarned you had better understand what these graphs are or you'll look you'll look your pages of your textbook and the lectures will look like you're about to eat alphabet soup not fun you don't want to be there all right so make sure you understand what they mean right away all right so the incremental value marginal benefit marginal private benefit in this case and we'll get it later in the semester we'll get into why what how that differs from maybe from marginal social typically it doesn't differ okay but sometimes it can all right so marginal private benefit the change in the value to society it, when marginal private benefit equals marginal social benefit which it typically does for the 80th one per day so i moved my wrong hand again per day okay where it's let's see my hand was covering day the 80th one adds $15 worth of value per day. And the 81st one will add a little less than 15, which is why you'll only sell 80 at a price of 15. The 81st one isn't worth $15 to anybody else out there. It doesn't generate that much value to anybody. If the price goes down, well, then you can sell more, right? Because that price is, 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 the, is the threshold that buyers must overcome to be willing to spend their hard-earned cash in that fashion it has to be worth the price preferably more to generate consumer surplus the buyers gain from trade but typically more than that okay so we're pretty much done with this first video where i just wanted you to get into some good habits about picking some points on the graph like where it says 23 and down here where it says uh, 230 and say in words what they mean and then pick one right on the graph like p is equal to 15 and q is equal to 80. if you had 80 you could sell them all for fifteen dollars if you put a fifteen dollar price tag on it you'll sell eighty of them all right and if you, if you give them away you can give away 230 of them if the price is 15 the consumer surplus is what three hundred twenty dollars per day right that's the area of that triangle which is the same thing as summing the gains from trade for each of the first eighty units and the eight of course the eightieth one there's no gain from trade it's a break even it's the yeah, i'm willing to buy it and not willing to buy it oh well why not All right it's just exactly worth eighty dollars to the person that purchases it uh oh one other thing that you can determine from this graph if you again using the price that we have marked on there at a price of 15 selling 80 of them you'll have total revenue of 1200 dollars. so where'd that come from Price times quantity is total revenue. It's, it's just duh. And by the way, that's how you know when you've studied enough, when you've gotten to duh. All right. So if you set the price at 15, you'll sell 80 of them. 15 times 80 is how much cash will be in the cash register from which to pay your expenses. And hopefully have some leftover profit. Okay. 
$1,200, 15 times 80 is $1,200 is the total revenue. Okay, so for every point in the demand line, you can determine a total revenue. And you'll, determine, you'll, you'll learn if you graph this demand line with total revenue for each of the quantities below it. It's a good idea, a good exercise to do that. By the way, buy yourself some graph paper. It makes it a lot easier to number the squares, right, and keep everything consistent. This is the, this piece of graph, this chunk of graph paper that, that I'm showing you here. It's just about a full chunk of it here. That was a dollar. Now, that was a few years ago when I bought this. Might be a dollar and a quarter by now. <gasps> Gasp. Right? And you're not, for this particular course, maybe that'll change. Maybe that won't be the, true for every time I use this video. But for both uses of this video and planning next semester, there is no textbook to buy. So you can spend a buck and a quarter or whatever on this graph paper. No need to get the engineering graph paper, the fancy stuff, just your basic little squares on there, right? Graph paper. Okay, let me see what, oh, I want to show you this. And after I leave that up on the screen for a second, I'm going to take a break before I record the next one. And you may or may not come back to watch right away. That's one of the nice things about these videos. All right, so there you go. Let me back up a little bit. There's all the numbers that I just processed. Whoops, I see one at the bottom that I didn't say. All right, if you take total revenue, okay, the TR, right, plus the consumer surplus, the 1200 and the 320 that I did mention. If you add those together, that's total value when the quantity is 80. Okay, and out of that total value, consumers get 320 of it, and the 1280 goes to the producers who sold it for $15. And out of that, hopefully, they'll uh, have some profit left over. You don't want them to have too much profit left over, right? Well, we'll see how that works in the market to drive price down to the minimum profit that'll keep the producers from running away. And you don't, so you don't want them to do that either. You don't want them to run away. You want them to keep producing the good. You want them to keep them kind of happy, but not too deliriously happy, right? Because that's uh, just a transfer from money from you to them. You want a bargain. All right, so again, at the top, price equals 15. Uh, that means the marginal benefit will be 15 when sales cease, right? So in other words, People will buy them until the last unit is worth just barely 15. See, MB, there's that alphabet soup, MB, marginal benefit. What does this mean over here? Change in total benefit. That's the shorthand, the triangle. Change in total benefit when you change the quantity uh, will be 15 for the last one sold. That's why it's the last one, right? Because the last one has to be just barely worth the price that has to be paid to acquire it. Right, and below that, the total revenue, $15 times 80. And then the consumer surplus, what's the formula for that? Uh oh, I used a bad word, formula. It's kind of a formula, but it follows from the definition. Right, so it's always demand minus price. That's almost always a triangle. How do you find the demand minus price? You take the max TB, which you remember from this, the max TB, or I'm sorry, the max MB, that was the 23, right? The most that's worth anybody, minus the price. So 23 minus 15 times Q0, that's the 80, and then divide by two. Let me conclude this video by quickly explaining the divide by two. Yes, it's a triangle, and it's one half the base times the height. So that's, that's the reason. What's the economic reason behind the divide by two? Because, see, the 23 minus 15 is the maximum gain from trade for anybody. I know I said it was 22.99 minus 15. Well, it's 23 is a nice round number. We'll go with that. Okay, so that's the maximum gain from trade. What's the minimum? Zero, right? On the last one, it's just barely worth 15, and it purchased for 15. So what's the average gain from trade? 23 minus 15 is 8, and 8 and 0 divided by 2 is 4, right? Ah, you see, there's the divide by 2, right? The divide by 2 gives you the average gain from trade for the 80 units, and then you multiply by the 80 units to get the total gain from trade. All right, that'll take care of this first one. I'm going to record the supply discussion here in just a second. Same basic ideas. Maybe you'll watch that one again in a couple seconds. Maybe you'll wait.